uh, you know, mental illnesses. Um, and uh, exercise is a protective factor for pretty much every disease that we know of. And if we flip this, if we think about health, right, as not just the absence of exercise, but this ability to thrive and, and to, um, and, and to you know, live a long, healthy life, uh, exercise is good for this. So moving stimulates and pretty much inside every uh, organ that people have looked at, uh, stimulates the production of more mitochondria. So if you move, the body feels, oh, I need more energy. How, how do I handle this? Let me make more mitochondria. That's called mitochondrial biogenesis. Um, and we know that this, this happens you know, a lot, for example, in muscles. Uh, if you go from being completely sedentary uh, to training for a marathon, you can double the number of mitochondria in your muscles. Uh, so there's quite a bit of plasticity there. And, and, and we've done some studies and uh, animal studies of chronic stress, for example, and this changes how many mitochondria, how much mitochondria are in different brain regions. Uh, so moving is number one thing we can do to increase a number or maybe the quality of the mitochondria. Number two is not eating too much. So being hungry once in a while is healthy. <laughs> and we evolved, you know, to do this. And the reason why being hungry is, is not eating too much is, is healthy, is not too clear. Maybe it's because it puts you into ketosis. Uh, maybe it because, it's because it prevents nutritional or metabolic oversupply or, you know, overload. People have done beautiful studies in, in cultured cells where you take cells and then you bombard them with sugar and with fat. And so that causes kind of, there's too much energy supply relative to what the cells need and this causes within minutes the fragmentation of mitochondria so you go from having a beautiful network of connected and you know dynamic uh, mitochondria talking to each other to a completely fragmented mitochondrial network so th there's mitochondrial fragmentation that arises uh you know very fairly quickly in cultured cells like this uh in response to this metabolic overload oversupply uh, so if you eat too much and uh, most people are able to, you know, take the excess glucose, excess, you know, fat and, and excess nutrients in the blood and then store this in, in subcutaneous adipose tissue, right? And then we call this obesity or, uh, um, you know, just, yeah, adiposity. Um, but the, the, the reason this exists physiologically is because having too much energy substrate, too much sugar, fats, or proteins in your blood is, is actually damaging. It's damaging to the mitochondria. So not eating too much and, you know, maybe um, something like intermittent fasting or just having just a good diet where you're hungry once in a while and then you have a good meal and then you're hungry and then you have a good meal. And, you know, every ancient tradition um, uh, has kind of a fasting period built into their, their, their culture, right? And that's probably for a reason because once in a while, uh, you know, being hungry actually stimulates uh, some cellular processes, probably mitochondria, in a way that is, you know, helpful and, and health promoting. So the magic question with fasting, though, is how long? And I know it's like impossible to answer with, with certainty, but, you know, time-restricted eating, it can help reduce calories, maybe, you know, it can help reduce insulin and improve um, insulin sensitivity to some degree, you know, probably like a minimum of 12 hours, maybe has to be 16, maybe has to be 18. Do you have any sense when it comes to mitochondria where the sweet spot is, or it's just clear that some amount of it helps and we still need to learn more about the specifics? Yeah, I think it's it's clear that some amount of it helps. I don't know that we have the right evidence to be prescriptive here about how long should you fast. And it probably depends if if you're on a ketogenic diet, right? And and you or you have a you're on a low carb diet, maybe you don't need to fast for as long to to you know derive the benefits than if you're on a, a regular, you know, a high carb diet. And maybe, you know, each person's metabolism is is pretty different. And it's clear that some people respond a lot better to, uh, you know, nutritional ketosis than some others. And uh, so the, the benefits are individual specific. And I think uh, in the same way that each person responds differently to exercise, there, there are some people for whom exercise is, is, doesn't seem to trigger a lot of health benefits. And, and it just makes them, it puts them into a bad place if, if you do too much of it. Um, but other people just respond amazingly <laughs> well to to exercise and it's, you know, life transforming. So I think there are individual differences that are poorly understood and 
most of the studies we do are based on like group differences. You do an RCT and then you look for a mean difference and like 50 people here, 50 people here. Oh, like exercise was good or, you know, keto diet was good. But there are 